Having made various vehicles for Denton Brook, including a radio-controlled mo mobile crane, I thought I'd have a go at a self-propelled steam crane, a narrow gauge one, of course. I had an old backwards crane kit that I thought might provide a basis for what I wanted, uh, but I knew it wasn't particularly suitable as it was never intended to be a working model. However, not to be daunted, I thought I'd give it a go. I started by building up the basics of the kit using silver solder out of habit, knowing that I'd end up chopping great bits of it away. Most are straightforward. The components used were the jib in its entirety, the base plate, the boiler and the roof a little modified. As the process went on and I could see my way, I added the side sheets and back sheet to provide an enclosed anglicised body from nickel silver. By this time the boiler was completely unseen and I might as well not have bothered, except it does a good job of connecting the upper body uh, to the base plate. I then scratch built a very simple plate frame chassis using one mil brass with a motor drive below the foot, uh, foot plate in order to allow the uh, crane to slew because this was to be uh, radio controlled. Uh, I chose a micro gear motor of 40 RPM at six volts in order to give a suitably slow speed. This initially drove a single axle through 12 mil nylon bevel gears that are available from Technobots. The building of this chassis was very basic, but because a year before I'd been given a Stepcraft CNC machine by my lovely wife, I decided to do the cutting by uh, computer CNC, uh, which worked really well. A saw and files would have done the job just as well, uh, but of course I can just sit back and watch this. Perhaps the only thing of mild interest regarding the chassis construction is the bearings because I wanted the wheel sets removable in case I needed to change the gauge in the future, possibly. I didn't want to solder the bearings in place. The normal top hat bearings, which we'll see in a minute, uh, were convenient. And so I slotted the frames down from the bearing holes in this initial uh, frame cutting process that you're watching. But I then needed to alter the bearings in order to stop them from rotating. Four little tabs were cut from brass, four little tabs were cut from brass and simply silver soldered to the top hat bearings and these then prevent the bearings from rotating when the axles are located in the frames, just like this. The wheel sets then simply restrained by using 0.8mm nickel silver wire through a centre block bearing on the underside of the bearings. I used a thin walled 15mm internal diameter bull race for the slew ring and because I could I drew up the slew ring gears on the computer and laser cut them in acrylic, building them up in three or four laminations However, of course, nowadays there are plenty of 0.5 module gears available in many different sizes on the internet, including bags of assorted ones from China. So I don't think sourcing gears is too much of a problem. The large ring with the bearing is epoxied to the chassis top plate. I use 15 mil standard copper pipe, dressed down slightly, silver soldered to a simple square brass plate to fit into the bearing and form the top slew pivot of the crane. This was then soldered onto the underside of the crane base plate and then the inner hole, which is 12 mil diameter, cut and ground out to make way for the slip ring. The slip ring, which was a six way, was a 12 mil outside diameter type from eBay. But on this job, being radio control, we only need two ways. So the black and red colours were selected and retained and the others were snipped off. If one was building a DCC crane, however, one would need four wires running through. Two for the drive motor feed 
and two for the power pickups from the wheels. The slip ring was epoxied into the copper tube, making sure it was facing in the useful direction, i.e. that the, ro uh, the rotating part was facing down. Pulley sheaves for the lines were machined up simply and carefully in brass on my little lathe using a razor saw and needle file for grooving and then a proper parting tool for parting them off. These were chemically blackened rather than painted and mounted on 0.8mm nickel silver wire for axles, making sure that they rotate freely and without catching. If you don't have access to a little lathe or similar tool, then you can buy uh, proper little pulleys from Nigel Lawson, so all is not lost. The crane needs two hoist motors, one for the derrick, lifting the jib, and the other for hoisting the hook. The necessity of having a large battery meant that there was only limited room available for these motors, so I ordered a pair of flip type gear motors, both of them at 40 RPM rated at 6 volts. These are motors that have a gearbox that extends sideways and the output shaft faces the other way, 180 degrees from the normal position. I fitted a little brass drum turned on the lathe directly to the output shaft to each of the gearboxes and the drums have a little small hole drilled in one side for the hauling line to pass through which is then fixed by tying a large knot on the other side. These gear motors were then mounted to a side plate I had soldered onto the crane bed for the purpose. If I remember rightly, I was able to tap the spare holes in the gearbox 10BA with no problem. Uh, they were the correct size for tapping as supplied. The hook needs to be as heavy as possible in order to fall under its own weight. The block was quite easily cut from a solid block of brass using a little Proxon table saw with a metal cutting blade. This is quite capable of cutting 8mm or so of solid brass if I took it gently and I was even able to cut the slot for the pulley sheave with it. I tend to do all my sheet cutting with this little saw. And likewise the hook itself was roughed out on the table saw and finished with needle files before being drilled and soldered uh, onto the bottom of the block. The little Proxon saw is an immensely useful tool and will actually make a very quick and neat job of cutting sheet brass or nickel silver, uh, non-ferrous ma materials only of course. The trick to make life easy is to run a sheet of something like 2mm MDF partially through the saw and then tape it into position using masking tape. You can then run your sheet of brass over this and into the blade. The MDF will fully support the brass sheet right up to the teeth of the blade, so you get a good, clean cut with minimal distortion. The same process holds good when you're cutting perspex and similar product products, as it helps prevent breakout chips appearing on one side, a tip well worth remembering for most table saws. When it finally came to roping the crane up or reeving it, I use a very heavy cotton, such as is used in leather work. This gives a rather better appearance than the lighter stuff one often sees, while still coping with a bend radius of the very small pulleys. I left at least 10 turns on each drum, plus the maximum working length of the line. Having at last got this little thing working, I found that despite its weight, when travelling, it would slip at the slightest irregular rail joint. I was disappointed as driving both axles was going to be difficult, uh, which was why I hadn't done it in the first place. However, it was vital that it should be done, and fortunately, I had some extra room between the frames. The solution I came up with was crude, but it did prove effective. I drew up and then cut with the trusty laser a set of five gears in acrylic. 
two were for the wheels on one side to go on the axle between the wheel and the frame and the other three were idler gears to transmit the drive from one axle to the other. A very simple gearbox was made to hold these three idlers and this gearbox was dropped between the wheel sets and epoxied into position. The result was dramatic. The crane would probably push or haul anything on the layout. I rather think these laser cut gears would probably not be suitable for high speed running, but nice low speed stuff they seem absolutely fine for. Each gear is made from three laminations of 0.8mm and they run on 1.6mm uh, silver steel axles. If I was making this now, I'd use a slightly different arrangement. I'd use an intermediate drive shaft with opposing bevel gears of 0.3 module to transmit the drive between the two axles. I've done this with a little 4mm scale radio control 6x4 lorry to drive both back axle and that actually works really well. One slightly unusual problem with this crane is the fact that it's built to 14mm gauge. This means that it's potentially very unstable when slewed to 90 degrees and the whole thing is balanced on the knife edge of 14mm track while trying to pick something up at least 100mm away. When complete it was necessary to weight the chassis down with lead at both ends to provide as much inherent stability as possible. And then I had to weight and balance the crane so that uh, when at 90 degrees and the jib lifted high but unloaded, the crane was almost tipping over backwards but not quite. This configuration then gave me the optimum lifting capacity so that I could slew unloaded into any position with the jib in any position. Of course, there would still be a real limit on the amount the crane could lift, particularly with the jib lowered and at 90 degrees. Still, operational limitations, within reason, add to the interest, and cranes do have these limitations, so fair's fair. A standard gauge version wouldn't have quite the same issues. This balancing exercise was, however, entirely successful and the steam crane has never toppled in service and successfully works through 360 degrees. It should be noted that the jib is comparatively short at 145 mil. Operationally, it would be very useful to have a longer jib as it would allow lifting higher and further away. However, as it turns out, this length has proved perfect for use on narrow gauge as a longer jib would certainly cause the crane to topple over at full reach. The finishing of this crane was the usual Halfords rattle cans followed by a rub down of 2000 grit wet and dry and a little bit of polishing and a lot of weathering. The dent and lettering was done by laser cutting the word onto masking tape uh, which was applied to uh, glass or acrylic and carefully peeling it off and sticking it onto the crane uh, which was then given a spray of uh, body colour, the maroon, to seal the edge of the tape and prevent seepage, and then sprayed white. After removing the masking tape stencil, uh, the bridges were then hand filled. Very simple. I managed to fit a uh, thousand milliamp per hour LiPo battery into this crane which enabled it to last a whole exhibition day before needing a recharge. Extremely useful. The charging socket is located behind a cutout in the back sheet and uses a 2.5mm jack plug and socket arrangement, which doesn't short out while it's being plugged in. The on-off switch is hidden behind a small swinging panel behind the driver's door. The steam crane is operated by a jumper T8SG two-stick transmitter configured for land use. 
The transmitter is also programmable with its own deviation software, which means I can reverse outputs, should I so wish, and also bind with many other models, though of course you can't operate them at the same time. The output strength is also variable, which may help to minimise interference for others, as well as maximise battery life. The receiver used is a Deltang RX 43D stroke 4 with an ADD1 board on the H4 output, which gives four reversible uh, ESC outputs. ESC stands for Electronic Speed Control Outputs. The receiver is actually located within the boiler barrel. All in all, this little project has been remarkably successful, especially as I had doubts about the viability of a working crane on 14 mil track. Of course, the principle and mechanics are equally applicable in other sizes, even 4 mil.